Hi, I'm John Atack, and this is a short talk about my experiences when I was involved with Scientology. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I went to Toulouse in the south of France um, because a guitar player had uh, persuaded me that he had some gigs for me to play there. I was a drummer. I still am. And um, I got there to find there were no gigs. I ended up stranded there for six weeks. I uh, went very short of food towards the end of that period. I got home and I found out that the girl I'd been living with for 15 months had disappeared into thin air. Um, this is a usual starting point for an experience with an authoritarian group where there's been some kind of dislocation from your normal routines and habits. It's not necessarily a negative dislocation. You might be moving to a new school or a new place. A relationship may have started, a relationship may have ended, taken up a new job. You find yourself in a new set of people. That makes us more susceptible um, to being recruited. In my case, <clears throat> I wasn't recruited. I walked in. I read um, half of a book by Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, called Science of Survival. I was very distressed over what had happened to me, and it seemed to offer a, a sensible therapy. I mean, I found out later that there were some things that were not very sensible, but this was just a practical way of dealing with stuck attention, you know, where your ideas were stuck on something and you, you needed to shift them. Uh, I went to the so-called Mission of Scientology in Birmingham, in Mosley, and there were people there. I was 19. The people running it were in their early 20s. There were a group of people who'd all graduated um, from university together, largely in art subjects. They were really friendly. They really believed. They weren't trying to con me in any way. They absolutely believed that Scientology was everything it claimed to be, that it would make you emotionally stable, that it would... Um, protect you from virus and disease, that it would raise your IQ, um, and ultimately that it would give you supernatural powers. None of these things is actually true. But in a very friendly environment, um, I quickly took courses. Um, I was a little worried about the financial aspects of Scientology from the start, and it's become a lot more worrying since then. But nonetheless, I then went down to the headquarters of Scientology in the UK, which is St. Hill Manor, which is just outside East Grinstead, south of 30 miles south of London, and um, basically immersed myself in Scientology. I was never a live-in member, and that makes a great difference, because if you're not um, totally immersed, if you're not isolated and engulfed, as Alex Stain has put it, then your commitment will be less. So although I was involved for nine years to the age of 28 and did a great deal, I did 25 of the available steps of Hubbard's um, bridge to total freedom. Uh, there were at that time only 27. Um, even though I, I did that, I was never sort of humiliated and abused. And that's unusual. Uh, people are, you know, milked financially. They're pretty much enslaved physically. They they will work a 90-hour week. Um, they, they don't have holidays. I've talked with people who perhaps get one day a year off. But as a public Scientologist, I wasn't aware that that was, was happening. I was a little surprised that they all wore sailor suits um, and considered them part, themselves part of Ron Hubbard's C organisation. That's... Uh, S-E-A-C, as in a body of water. Um, I stayed there for oh, a year and a half, and um, eventually I, I became irritated by the sort of militaristic attitude. Um, you know, you've got to be on time, you've got to do all these things. It was like going back to school, and I didn't really enjoy school. I don't like being told what to do. I'm not very good at it. So I came back up to the Midlands, um, spent two years in art college, which was great fun. Started exhibiting paintings, made 
a meagre living from painting. During that time, I had very little to do with Scientology. Then I was talked back in um, by a man who became a dear friend and who still is a dear friend many years later, and carried on. And the idea was that you would have counselling sessions, which were called auditing. I did a number of courses and learned how to do this, various kinds of this. Many of the techniques that are used will be found in other psychotherapies, and um, it gives me a certain caution about psychotherapies. Uh, a lot of what is happening is, is guided imagination. So you are, for example, expected to remember incidents from your previous incarnations, your past lives. Um, and people fairly readily do this. I began to suspect this process when I realised that most of the people around me didn't have particularly good memories. And if you asked them what they'd had for breakfast yesterday, they couldn't tell you. But they'd quite happily tell you about being on a spaceship 100 million years ago in some kind of battle. I've now had uh, ooh, a very long experience of this. Uh, so I've been able to talk with probably more than a thousand people who've been involved in Scientology. And not one of them has ever provided any proof of a past life, you know, of a previous incarnation. You know, they might talk about having fought at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, but they can't talk in the English dialect that they would have spoken, or indeed, if they're on the other side, the French dialect they would have spoken. So remembering languages from past lives doesn't seem to happen. Giving descriptions of locations... And one of the things with Scientology that's, that's very interesting is that there is no attempt to prove any of these claims. And the claims are pretty wild. The, you know, Hubbard claimed he could cure cancer, leukaemia, raise people from the dead even. And there's absolutely no evidence to support this. Scientology is incredibly invasive. I've dealt with about 600 people in their recovery. And with some people, it really does just take an afternoon to get them to sort of snap out of it and start thinking again. But because Hubbard's works, I mean, this, this man is listed in the, the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific author of all time. I'm not sure they didn't cheat to get that result. But even so, he was very prolific. And so you're saturated by all of these ideas that he had. And you don't think about them um, you're not really meant. You're not meant to sit and discuss them, um, and it's put forward that this is a technology of the mind and spirit. And you're told that a tremendous amount of research has been done. Hubbard claimed that that he was a nuclear physicist, um, which is a lie. He was thrown out of university, George Washington University, having failed a course in atomic and molecular physics, as he himself admitted in an obscure lecture. He claimed to be a wounded war hero who'd cured his war wounds um, with the, the development of Dianetics, his original version of Scientology. That's not true. He would never saw combat. Um, he also claimed that he'd studied with gurus in the East, in India, in China, in Tibet, and even in Mongolia, and that he'd fused the wisdom of the East with his nuclear physics. This is completely bogus. Um, he was actually a writer of cheap fiction, pulp fiction, um, during the period, what's called the golden age of science fiction, as science fiction developed in the 1940s, and who had a very creative imagination, and he managed to um, generate a very close following of people. Uh, Scientology come un came under investigation in Australia, in Canada and South Africa, in what is now Zimbabwe, uh, and in the UK. And very negative reports were issued about its practices of harassing critics, which was something I found a great deal out about later on. Um, and what happened for me was that, along with about probably half of the membership back in 1983, we believed that Hubbard was gone that he was no longer running things. In fact, he was absolutely still in the driving seat, as I later found. And we splintered away and created an independent Scientology movement. There were probably about 
a maximum of about 50,000 people involved in Scientology all around the world at that time. So about 25,000 of us left. And probably of those 10 or 12,000 carried on practicing Scientology. Not long after I left, and I found myself at the very centre of the UK independent movement, um, helping to protect the, the new um, Scientology independent groups from the harassment of the mother group. Um, there were convictions um, in 1980, 81, 11 Scientologists, including Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue Hubbard, were sent to prison in the United States for um, kidnapping, false imprisonment, uh, faking government credentials, theft of hundreds of thousands of pages of uh, documents from American government departments. There was a similar prosecution in Canada and another one in, in France. And you have this peculiar situation that you have a group which puts itself forward as a religion and claims all of the privileges of a religion, including not having to pay taxes, but is actually running an intelligence agency. Within two months of leaving, I, I was presented with a huge pile of documents about Hubbard's life gathered by a journalist who worked under the name Michael Lynn Shannon. And for me, the proof was irrefutable. Ron Hubbard was a liar. And he'd said, honesty is sanity. The road to truth must be trod with true steps. And so I started to back away from Scientology, but carried on being the defence for the independent Scientologists for several years after that. I became historian of Scientology. I wrote a book which is now published as Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, which I think is still the only uh, history of a post-war authoritarian cult group. There are a lot of ex-member accounts, but bringing it all together. That book was used by uh, Sunday Times journalist Russell Miller as the basis for his biography of Hubbard, Barefaced Messiah. What a brilliant title. And I worked with him from before he signed the contract uh, for that through the litigation where we successfully managed to get it published. Um, not long after that, my book was published. It eventually became a bestseller at Amazon. And I carried on helping people who didn't know what had happened to them. They'd, off, they'd spent all of their money. Um, they'd given inheritances away. They'd sold their houses and given the money to Scientology. Scientology is very rapacious. It runs under what is called the governing policy, which I never saw when I was a member, where Hubbard says, the governing policy of Scientology is make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make even more money. I started to learn of the brutal practices when Hubbard had a little flotilla of boats in the Mediterranean, where he would throw people overboard uh, for a misdemeanor from, from height greater than the high diving board at the swimming pool. And sometimes blindfolded, tied at the ankles, often people who couldn't swim. And this might be for being two minutes late for a course. He became tyrannical. There's a point where he put a, a child who was not yet five years old into the chain locker on one of the ships. Chain locker is where the chain is stored when the ship is moving. So it's a filthy little hole full of stinking bilge water and rats and entirely dark. And he put this child in there for three days. So I learned fundamentally that Scientology was the opposite of, of what it claimed to be. It wasn't here to help people overcome trauma and liberate themselves from control, to become self-determined. It existed to enslave people psychologically and physically. Um, when Hubbard died in 1986, he left a fortune of $648 million, all of it taken from Scientologists. Not long before that, his crew members were denied the use of toilet tissue because he felt they weren't making enough money. Um, so let's, uh, let's leave that there. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions about what I've said and indeed about Scientology. I've written many papers. Um, I've delivered papers at conferences over the years. And since 1996, I've been much more involved in the the general run of authoritarian groups, whether they be terrorist groups, gangs, religious, uh, pseudo-religious or pseudo-therapy cults, commercial cults, multi-level marketing, large group awareness trainings uh, like uh, the Forum or Landmark Trust or Lifespring. And 
you know, my work has been to try and understand what is common to these things, how we are lured into them, and how our critical thinking is undermined by the induction of peak experiences. So very happy to take any questions. Um, I'm John Atak. Thanks very much for lending me your time. Thanks. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.